Hello, this is a video on Socrates and the natural philosophers, not Socrates, it's Socrates. And this is the first in a series of videos in which I'm basically going to be going through the content of Sophie's World, uh, which is a novel uh, that is a, a fairly painless way to introduce the history of European oriented philosophy. Um, uh, Sophie's World defines philosophy as the, uh, as the art of wonder. Um, I'm not sure that, that how helpful that is, but philosophy is that, that study that stands outside of all other study and says, what you guys doing? So when a historian does history, the philosopher of history says, what is, what is he really, do, what is she doing, he doing when they talk about history? What's going on there? Or what is the artist actually doing? What makes something good art? Or, or what is the scientist actually doing? Uh, or what, what am I doing when I, when I claim to know something? Or what, do I, what am I doing when I say something's real? Um, or how should I live? Should I kill you? Should I not kill you? You know, how should we best live together? How should I vote? Uh, we're just, what, 10 days away from the uh, 2020 election, uh, as I make this video, which some have said is, is the most important election of, of our lived, lifetime. You know, how should I vote? Um, these are, uh, I think, at base, philosophical questions. They are what we might call meta questions. Philosophy asks what everything else is about. Um, and that's philosophy. So this video is on Socrates and natural philosophers. It's, it's the beginning of Western philosophy, of European philosophy. I'll talk at the end of this video about this project and a little bit about um, uh, my, my story in um, Sophie's world and, and teaching philosophy. But for now, let's get right into it. So what is a myth? Well, in popular language, a myth is uh, something like, well, Ken, I hear you can bench press a thousand pounds. Well, nah, it's a myth. I can only bench press 530 pounds. Yeah, not really, actually. But um, a myth in popular language is something that's just false that people believe. Well, that's, that's a popular definition of myth. And as uh, I said in my series of, I've gone through now all of philosophy from a topical uh, perspective. As I talked about in my philosophy of language video, words mean how people are using them. And since people are using the word myth that way, that is a meaning of the word myth. Nothing I can do about it. Justine Garter, uh, who is the author of Sophie's World, um, defines a myth this way. A myth is a story about the gods which sets out to explain why life is as it is. I am means italics mine. Um, I think Garter is actually wrong here. Um, well, again, that's what people, that, that is something that people think myths are. That is a popular use of the word myth. So he's, let me back up, he's not wrong because that is a way people use the word myth. Um, so we've had two, two meanings so far. A myth is something that's just plain false, false with a vengeance. And then there's this myth of, you know, the myth of, of Thor and his hammer, you know, the myth of Zeus, the story about the gods, you know, per Persephone, you know, who's taken down into the underworld for six months of the year and it becomes winter until she gets to go back home to her mother. And then spring comes out and then the winter comes again and she goes to Hades in the underworld and then spring comes, you know, um, this is, um, Garter might say, a, a really bad explanation for the changing of the seasons. But a lot of people would say, yep, that's a myth, the myth of Persephone and Hades and so forth. Um, so again, that's the way people use the word myth. One way the people use the word myth. So yeah, okay, fine. That is a meaning of the word myth. However, it is not the, the way that experts on myths use the word. And uh, I'm going to paraphrase the experts, and then I'm going to tell you a definition by an actual expert. So I, would, I might define a myth as a story expressing a mystery, um, where mystery uh, is a word related to myth, mystery, myth. Myths were far more, I would say, <clears throat> about expressing. Ancient myths were expressions of the mysteries of the world. To say that ancient myths were just, they were just bad explanations, I think unknowingly reads our way of thinking about science into the ancient world. For us, we think science is about explanation. 
And so we just assume that myths are primitive explanations that are really bad. But what if myths are actually far more about expressing mysteries about the world? I, I mentioned the myth of Thor. In the myth of Thor, and Sophie's world mentions this as well, Thor, um, uh, his hammer is stolen and he dresses up like a woman uh, and uh, the person who stole it falls in love with him. And then on their wedding day, he kills, he, kills, he kills the guy and gets his hammer back. Now, if this is an explanation, uh, now in that myth, it's, it's expressing the changing of the seasons as well, because without Thor's hammer, he's sad and it's winter. But um, this is a bad explanation for the changing of the seasons because this guy only dies once, right? I mean, he's not gonna come back to life next year and Thor's not gonna deceive him again, dressing up as a woman. And then Thor's gonna get his hammer back and it's gonna be spring again. I mean, as, a, as an explanation goes, this is a horrible story. Um, so it must be that there's something deeper going on than an explanation. And that actually maybe Garter has fallen prey um, to uh, cultural blindness that he assumes that myths are just bad explanations. But what if the story of Thor's hammer is meant to express the mystery of the seasons changing? Now, we, we wouldn't do it that way. We could make up a story. You know, I could make up a story about um, the, um, the myth of Ken's uh, paycheck, you know, about little uh, uh, Kashistis, you know, little green men who live in your bathtub, who at twice a month um, they get really excited about you taking that two week bath. You know, I only, you know, I only take a bath every, every other week, right? And then, and then the Kashistis, you know, go to the bank and put money in my account. Yay, you know, um, I could make up a myth, a modern myth too. Um, that's just not, uh, not usually what we do. Um, but a, 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 an ancient myth was more, more about expressing the mysteries of the world than science and explanations as we know it. Now, did people think these God stories were real? A lot of them did, especially the popular people did. There were, of course, the intelligentsia who didn't necessarily think the myths were real. The Stoics didn't think the Stoics uh, were a group that we'll come across in the next video, I suspect, or two, maybe two videos from now. But the Stoics, you know, basically believed that the, the, the stories of the gods were symbolic of natural forces and things like that. More on that later. Well, here's what Jack Finnegan, uh, well, this is what I was just been, was just saying to you. To place the emphasis on explanation is probably to miss the principal function of ancient myths. Here's what Finnegan, Jack Finnegan says. A myth is not then in the first instance a fanciful tale. It is a symbolic or poetic expression of that which is incapable of direct statement. So if we were to say that there, that something is mythical, we're not necessarily saying that it's false. We might be saying it's true in another way. Um, well, okay. I mean, for example, is it Psalm 82 where God sits in the council of the other gods and God says to the gods of the other nations, he says, you guys are gods, but you're going down. You're gonna die like men because you haven't been treating your people right. You know, um, and I, that's not how God sounds, but this is a, a somewhat, it is a mythical picture, right? Because there aren't other gods uh, to the other nations. This is, this is a Zeus-like uh, council meeting in Psalm 82. Um, at least that's the picture we get of God speaking to the gods who are over. Oh, you, king of Babylon, you're going down. I'm shouting timber. You know, you, king over here uh, of uh, Assyria, you're going down. I'm shouting timber. You know, so <clears throat> um, that's not literal, right? Nobody thinks that this is a literal uh, event that ever took place. It is the Bible using a mythical image to, to portray a truth, namely that the other, the other gods and the kings of the other, I'm sorry, the other nations and the kings of the other nations have not treated their people in a way that, that pleases God. Now, that might make us a little uncomfortable. What, uh, how could that be in the Bible? But it's there, Psalm 82, read it. Um, I think that's the, probably the best explanation. Is that Psalm false? No, the Psalm's true. It's just not literal. Okay, well, so myth, before we had uh, European philosophy, we had myth. Now let's talk about the, the natural philosophers. Why were these called the natural philosophers? Because they went around au natural? No, that's not why they were called the natural philosophers. They were called natural philosophers 
because they began to look to what we would think of as elements of nature as as fundamental to the world. What we're seeing in these philosophers is the birth of science, um, at least Western science. So let's talk about the Milesians. Uh, they didn't have sores all over them, but in the 500s BC, um, this is at Miletus. Miletus is a city on the um, uh, on the western shore of Turkey today. It wasn't Turkey back then. There were no Muslims back then. This was, you know, centuries before Muhammad. Uh, probably what eleven, you know, ten centuries before Muhammad. Um, this is even before Jesus, uh, about 500 some years before Jesus, we had uh, the birth of European philosophy. Again, philosophers are everywhere. Everybody's a philosopher, just not everybody's a good philosopher. Uh, but the birth of Western philosophy is often traced to a guy named Thales uh, who lived in Miletus. And it's, it's, another, it's another Greek. These are Greeks, by the way. You might say, well, there can't be Greeks in Turkey. Well, back then, the the Greece had a number of colonies on the westernmost shore of, of Turkey, and they spoke Greek. And so there was a guy in Miletus, um, by the way, Tom, uh, the Apostle Paul stops at Miletus in the book of Acts on his third on missionary journey on his way back to um, uh, Jerusalem, as, as I recall, at least. So Thales is uh, sometimes called the father of European or Western uh, philosophy. Uh, because he suggested that every the world is rests on water. Now I'm not sure exactly what he meant by that, because actually I think a lot of people believe that water was underneath the uh, the land. Um, but uh, Aristotle sees in Thales the birth of looking to a natural explanation uh, for why things are, rather than to the gods as an explanation for why things are. Again, I'm. I'm not sure how unique Thales was on the one hand, because I mean, Genesis said, what does Genesis 1, 2 said? Um, there was darkness on the face of the deep and the spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. So waters are there in the very beginning too in, in Genesis 1. And then also uh, Hesiod, who is a Greek poet, talks about the creation of the world out of waters. The Enuma Elish in Babylon talks about uh, waters uh, being part of the beginning of creation. So I'm not sure that Thales is as unique as sometimes uh, people make him out to be. Finally, a scientist, finally someone who doesn't come up with these God explanations for things. I'm not sure that's really that simple, but nevertheless, Thales is often uh, considered to be the father of Western philosophy because he looked to water as the source of, of all things, or there's water in everything. Um, so again, uh, that's what people say, whether it's true or not, you know, you, you can do some investigation. I'm sure we have a lot of information because I think he might have also said there were gods and everything. But anyway, um, then we had a guy named Anaximander uh, who believed that the, the universe was constantly coming in and out of existence, that the world evolves and then it dissolves and then it evolves and it dissolves. What's interesting is um, this is reminiscent of a modern uh, to, well, 20th century theory called the oscillating Big Bang. I don't know if you've ever heard of Stephen Hawking. He was a very famous uh, genius physicist um, who did a lot of research on black holes, uh, only recently died uh, a couple of years ago. Um, he was in, in a TV show called The Big Bang Theory. Um, he had, um, um, I think it was um, multiple, was it multiple sclerosis? Um, and um, he, his muscles degenerated um, severely. I can't remember wh which disease he had. Um, um, I need to know, hold that thought. Sorry, ALS, uh, 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 lateral sclerosis uh, is the LS part, myotrophic lateral or something like that. Um, so um, he was in a wheelchair for much of his later life and had to talk through a computer. Um, but um, the reason I'm telling you about it is because for a long time, he preferred this oscillating Big Bang where the universe explodes. And then because it has so much mass, it slows down and then it stops, and then it collapses in and on itself and explodes. Um, and this would make a, this is a theory that would, uh, would uh, make it so that you didn't need God allegedly, you know, because the universe would just be this endless back and forth. Eventually, uh, if I remember correctly, Hawking had to admit that the evidence was not good for a continuous oscillating Big Bang, and he, he, of course, he never, never believed in God after, uh, in his later life. But, 
but he um, uh, he did have come up with that, had to come up with another explanation. But it, what's interesting is Anaximander seems to have something a little bit like uh, the oscillating Big Bang theory. And there, we're going to see this with Democritus in a second. And um, what's, you know, probably our first instinct is to say, wow, these guys were really smart back then to come up with the same theories that would come back into modern science in the 20th century. Um, and they were smart people. I mean, we shouldn't think that these people were any less intelligent than we are today. We just have so much more to go on, right? I mean, we, we're not starting where they started. We, we, have, we have so many thousands of years of human history, and especially the last 500 years of science to, to stand on top of. I mean, how can we not be, in a way, smarter than they are? If we're, if we're not smarter than they are, there's a problem because we've got so much to stand. We're standing on up here. Um, whereas they were, you know, way back standing on here. So if we're not smarter than they are, there's a something's wrong with us. If you, if you get what I'm saying, but it's not. But but we shouldn't just think though. Wow, they were so smart um, to have seen this way back then, um, because in some ways the way that we express our thoughts today are because we are using their language. So like when we talk about atoms today. We are repurposing the language of Democritus, who we're going to see in a second. And so if it weren't for Democritus, we might still have the same idea, but we, we might call it something else. Um, and so there's, it's not just that they were smart back then and came up with things that we're only now seeing are actually true, but also the way we express where we are at in history has been influenced by their language. We're using their language. And so some of the similarity is, is that it's the sound. We're using the words that they, they used. Um, Anaximenes was also from Miletus. And if, if, Thales, if Thales said something like, everything is made out of water, Anaximenes said something like, well, everything is made out of air. And there's a lot of air around, right? You know, and of course, they didn't know that matter can not be created or destroyed. They didn't know that. They didn't know that elements can't transmute into other elements, uh, not normally. You know, uh, even in the Middle Ages, you know, the idea that uh, let's find a way to turn stuff into gold. Well, sorry, not going to happen. Um, so, um, so they're they're able to say, well, maybe all this matter has somehow been developed out of the air. Um, you know, we would say, nah, no, that's just, no, nah, no. Nah. But, but, you know, they don't, they don't have the benefit of our high school, you know, chemistry class. All right. So that, those were the Milesians. And now in Italy, believe it or not, there were Greek colonies in Italy years before Rome was much of a thing. Before Rome even took over the whole, you know, uh, Italian peninsula. Um, there was a guy named Pythagoras. You've probably heard of the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It comes from Mr. Pythagoras, who lived on the heel, around the heel of uh, Italy, if I remember correctly, around Syracuse. Um, and Pythagoras believed that number was the ultimate reality. This is a little tempting to me, in a way, uh, believe it or not, um, because, I mean, I don't. Okay, I want to say it right now. I don't believe this. But it's a little tempting because it does seem like um, mathematic, mathematics, to a large extent, is an expression of something fundamentally true about the world. You think of the number pi, 3.14159265353, and so forth to infinity. Uh, it keep, it's, an it's an irrational number. It won't stop. But anyway, um, uh, pi is the ratio of the circumference uh, to the distance. Um, uh, circumference divided by distance is pi of any circle anywhere in the universe. Uh, there, there, so there's a mathematical dimension you know, to the universe in, in relation to, to spheres. Is it, I don't know if you've ever pondered it. It is really amazing that we can capture realities like this in, in, num in, in formulas and in expressions. It just, it boggles the mind. Um, or, you know, is this an argument for the existence of God? Um, but uh, you think of a number like E, 
2.718281828, it's another irrational number. Um, the number E um, is uh, very important when, you, when you're talking about um, uh, population growth and the way things grow exponentially and, and so forth. They're, they're just these patterns um, to the universe um, that are uh, just amazingly captured by uh, algebraic and, 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 and other formulas. Um, it's really quite amazing how, how it all works. And so Pythagoras, of course, he didn't know about some of these things, uh, but he was a right smart man um, and had a community. Uh, almost, there was almost a religious dimension to the Pythagorean community. It was like a, almost like a cult. Um, and, uh, they, you know, for example, he believed in reinc reincarnation, that our souls are trans the transmigration of souls, that our souls kind of um, leave our bodies and then come back into another one. Um, but um, Pythagoras believed that number was the ultimate reality. Now, uh, I have not, I have not given in to this temptation, uh, but I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a philosopher like you are, and I wonder, you know, what's up with that? Why is it that, that we can capture the reality of the world um, in numbers? It is curious, is it not? Um, but Mr. Pythagoras. Okay, so then you have uh, two opposing views in the 400s, fifth century BC, 400s. So in Elia, um, you had a guy named Parmenides. And Parmenides says, nope, there's no such thing as change. It just looks like things are changing. That if you, if you, the truths of the mind do not change. Truth, absolute truth in your head, that the contemplation of reality, numbers, uh, pi does not change. Ah, it just came down the pipe. They're changing pi. Nope, pi never changes. E never changes. Um, square root of two never changes. Um, and Parmenides would basically say, it only appears that things are changing. Um, that truth never changes. By the way, we're leading up, uh, we're gonna, the next video will be on Plato and um, Aristotle. And Plato would take a little bit of Parmenides and a little bit of Pythagoras and you stir it together, a little honey, you know, and then you get Platonism. Uh, Plato believed, as we'll say in the next video, that, that the, the world of ideas is a fixed world and that all of these shadowy things, you know, down here are all shadowy copies of the eternal realities that never change. Um, by the way, I've got uh, Raphael's School of Athens behind me with Plato pointing up and Aristotle pointing down. I'm gonna leave that up quite a bit, uh, at least for the next video. Okay, so um, the, the point of view that fo focuses on ideas and basically sa says that truth is something that we contemplate with our mind um, is rationalism. Um, there'll be many rationalists before we're done, especially when we get to the, um, the enlightenment. But okay, so you have this point of view, nothing changes. But of course, then you have the practical Heraclitus. Heraclitus basically says everything changes. All things flow, things are constantly changing. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the old cartoon Poc Pocahontas. She quotes Heraclitus, you can't step into the same river twice. Um, you can't stay, step into the same river twice because by the time you get your foot back in, the river has flowed and it's a different river now. Um, and so Heraclitus basically thought that fire, uh, which changes everything, right? I mean, uh, I, I, thankfully, I've never had uh, my house cat, catch on fire, you know, never happened. Um, but, but fire changes stuff um, and you can't get it back. I, you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And so um, you could see why he would consider fire to be the stuff that underlies, you know, everything. So we've had Thales who said it was water. We've had Anaximenes who said it was air. We've had Heraclitus who says fire is the most basic substance. But you can see that the uh, Parmenides and Heraclitus are on opposite ends of this. Parmenides is, is focusing on thinking and saying, no, nothing, truth just doesn't change, Parmenides says. And then you've got Heraclitus said, open your eyes, Parmenides, look outside. You know, the sun just came up. It's a change. Stuff's always changing. Things never stop moving. Everything, you know, is always changing. Um, and so both of these probably have, there's probably some truth to both of these people, uh, but, but um, hey, we're working it out, right? They're the early guys, the natural philosophers. The, you know, they, they're the beginnings of Western philosophy. 
Um, and so uh, uh, they don't, you know, they're just throwing out ideas there. Okay, so then we begin to see syntheses, you know, as, as time goes by, Empedocles. Empedocles, I think, is the best so far on this natural thing we're doing here. He basically said, well, what if there are four basic substances? Earth, wind, and fire. No, that's a nice, one of my favorite groups. But anyway, uh, earth, air, and fire, and water. So he's taken Thales' water, Heraclitus's fire, um, and Eximenes' air, and he's thrown a little dirt on it. And he's basically saying, what if there are four basic substances? And that these come together in different combinations. Does this sound familiar? Because if you've ever taken a chemistry class, um, I mean, basically Empedocles, his, his periodic table only has four elements on it, you know, but he's, he's saying the same thing that modern uh, chemistry says, namely that if you take everything in the world and you break it apart, you're going to end up with a certain finite number of elements. And of course, Democritus, we're going to see, is he the next guy? No, he's not. Anyway, Democritus will suggest that, that there are fundamental atoms to everything. But Empedocles says there are four, four basic substances that everything is made up of. And then he can like, okay, that's a little touchy-feely here, Empedocles, that love brings them together and then strife breaks them apart. Um, but um, he's, I think we're making, we're making progress here. He is a natural philosopher who suggests that there are four basic elements and that love and strife is what holds them together. By the way, um, Aristotle will throw uh, a little bit of um, eth ether on it. So Aristotle has a fifth element, ether being the, the element that the heavens are made out of. Um, and that, that will be a concept that will resurface in the late 1800s in physics, the idea of the ether. It's generally disproved, uh, but anyway. Um, so, um, we're, we're making, I think we're, we're getting somewhere here. Um, Anaxagoras. Anaxagoras basically said there's a little something of everything and everything. Again, this is kind of like modern chemistry, right? There's a little carbon in this and a little carbon in that, a little carbon in this. Now, again, it's not something of everything and everything. It's more like that everything has similar things in them. I think the periodic table, a periodic table may only have, um, uh, hundred, well, it doesn't have 90 some naturally occurring elements. I mean, they've been able to synthesize for a very short period of time uh, over uh, uh, enough elements to go over a hundred. Is it 108 elements on the periodic table? I don't remember. Uh, I'm sorry, I wish I had a photographic memory. Uh, who are you? I don't remember your name. Anyway, so, but Anaxagoras has this, this idea that there's something of everything um, in everything. There's Democritus. So Democritus is the one who came up with atoms. Atom means things that can't be cut. Um, um, now, of course, um, that all went to pot in 1945 when we dropped the atomic bomb um, on Hiroshima. But anyway, um, there was a debate at that point. Can you, can you split the atom? Can you not split the atom? And of course, they did. My dad, by the way, in World War II, um, remembers them debating before the atomic bomb went off. Uh, whether you could split the atom. Um, that's interesting. Uh, he, was in, he was in the army in Europe. But anyway, um, atoms. Uh, Democritus' suggestion was basically that everything is made up of these small little things that you can't cut anymore called atoms, atoms, uncuttables. Um, they're like Legos, if you've ever played with Legos. And this is an illustration of Legos, I think uh, comes from Sophie's world, the idea that you can you can put pieces together into things. And of course, Democritus even believed that we had atoms in our soul. Of course, soul, the soul for Democritus was not some, some little Ken escape pod that leaves at death and, and you know, it goes on to eternity. Um, the soul for Democritus was the, the, life, the life force. Um, and, and Democritus believed that my soul was made up of, of atoms. He believed that my soul was material. The living part of me was part of thin matter, maybe, uh, but, but that it was part of me. Um, and so a lot of our view of the soul, as we'll see when we get to Descartes, comes from Descartes. Um, and so they, they viewed the life force as something a little bit different uh, than the way that we might view the soul today. Democritus did not believe in an afterlife of any kind. Um, in fact, um, Democritus is, is at the base of 
a group called the um, um, uh, Epicureans. The Epicureans certainly did not believe in an afterlife. The, the Roman Epicureans, where they kind of uh, went downhill, um, but uh, the Greek Epicureans were a little bit more philosophical and contemplative. Uh, but the, uh, the Roman Epicureans were like, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. Um, anyway, but uh, certainly the Epicureans did not believe, Epicurus did not believe in any kind of meaningful afterlife. And they were following the, the basis of their, of their sense of reality, of their metaphysic, with their basis of reality, uh, was the atoms of, of Democritus. Okay. Um, he was a materialist. A materialist is somebody who believes that the only thing that exists is basically material or matter. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna take a slight detour. Those, those are the natural philosophers. They are the ones who began to, to and they're, we're seeing the birth of, of science as it were um, in, in these, these natural philosophers. And um, they are precursors to um, Socrates, which, which I'm gonna end this video with Socrates. But um, Sophie's World also takes a detour into some developments in history writing. And now again, so uh, Sophie's World is very Eurocentric. Uh, it is a very Euro Euro Western philosophy. And uh, I am trying to um, um, fill in some of the gaps for this course I'm teaching in the spring, fill in some of the gaps with Chinese philosophy and some other philosophies, and especially philosophies that highlight uh, people of color um, and some of the work that's being done. Um, there again, uh, Western philosophy is, is, I don't want to say it's it's racist, although some would. I mean, definitely there are some people who'd say that Western philosophy is racist, um, but it's definitely European. Um, and so I'm trying to supplement that. Uh, but since I'm following Sophie's World in this uh, series, um, it's uh, unfortunately going to be very Euro-centric. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, Justine Garter would consider Herodotus the father of history. Uh, again, that's not fair, is it? It's not fair. I mean, people have been doing history. Um, in every culture, there are people who do history. What, what Garter would say is different about Herod Herodotus, or what some would say is different about Herodotus, is that Herodotus tried to be objective about his own race, about his own tribe, as it were, his own ethnicity. So Herodotus was a Greek, and yet in his um, hi histories, Herodotus doesn't necessarily think that the Greeks were always right. Um, Herodotus tries to be objective, of course, none of us are objective, but Herodotus tries to be objective about people that weren't necessarily, well, I mean, the Persians definitely weren't the friends of, of Greece, and yet Herodotus tries to be even-handed somewhat in his treatment, for this reason, there's a Roman, uh, there's a Roman Greek uh, by the name. Uh, I, he's a Roman citizen, but he's a Greek by by ethnicity, named Plutarch, who writes around the time of Christ. And Plutarch says Herodotus isn't the father of history; he's the father of lies. You sit on a throne of lies. You smell of beef and cheese. Um, uh, Herodotus, <clears throat> um, and and why does Plutarch not like Herodotus? because he thinks Herodotus um, is not uh, loyal to the Greek people. Uh, this calls into question Plutarch, I think. I think. I think we have to question whether Plutarch is the best historian. And of course, Plutarch doesn't really write histories. He writes um, bio, bio, bio um, not bio, but bioi. He writes stories of people's life. Um, and um, does he write good history? No, <laughs> he writes about, he's interested in character. And of course, this is a feature of the ancient biography that is, we have to, we have to think this when we read ancient biographies, even the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that, that ancient biography was far more about teaching moral lessons or teaching truths than it was about an attempt to present history in an even-handed kind of secular way that like we do today. So all of that is to say that Herodotus uh, is the beginning of Greek history for sure. Um, he has a quote in um, in his history uh, that is custom is king over all. This is basically basically an expression of what we might call relativism. Um, 
he basically says, and this is, of course, one of the reasons why Plutarch doesn't like him. Plutarch wants to say, oh, the Greeks are the best. But Herodotus says, you know what? Everybody thinks their own people's ideas are the best. Greeks think their ideas are the best. Persians think their ideas are the best. Herodotus basically says, well, the, the, the ideas you like the most just depends on where you grew up. Um, so, so it's kind of, kind of a relativistic uh, perspective. The story that he uses, that he tells, is a great story that leads to this conclusion. He talks about um, two groups of people, the Greeks and a group called the Calatians. And the Greeks and the Calatians uh, appear before a particular king. And the king says, so what do you do with your parents when they die? And the, um, the Greeks say, well, when our parents die, we put them on a funeral pyre um, uh, and we, we set their bodies on fire. Um, and the Calatians are like, oh, what a horrible thing to do, you evil people. How could you set your parents on fire? You are evil, evil people. And the king says, well, what, what do you do with your dead? And the Calatians say, well, well of course we eat them. <laughs> uh, anyway, and Herodotus says, oh, well, there you have it. I mean, people's customs is what's right. Uh, again, I don't, I don't, I believe there that we can, I believe we can move toward uh, certain universal norms, um, um, especially as a Christian, I believe this, because I believe that everybody's life, everybody's created in the image of God, all people's life is important, all lives matter, of course, I believe Black Lives Matter, and I don't believe it's wrong to say Black Lives Matter, I'll just say that, but, you know, leaving that issue aside, um, everybody's life does matter. I mean, that's that's true as well. Um, and so this is, this is, there is a universal valuing of all people's lives that, that I, I believe is a Christian. Uh, and of course, I believe that we should especially address those whose lives are in, mo in most danger. Uh, that's that's uh, the place to focus at the moment. And, and I, so I support Black Lives Matter in that, in that uh, sense. Um, but uh, Herodotus it basically lays out what we might call a relativist agenda. Uh, well, he doesn't have an agenda. Uh, he's just trying to tell it the way he sees it. Um, Thucydides is another um, or a Greek historian that follows Herodotus. Um, Thucydides is, um, again, he tries to be objective. He writes about the, the Peloponnesian War. And um, uh, what's interesting is he says he makes up speeches. He says this is in, in his introduction. He says, you know, there were some uh, speeches given at various times and I wasn't there and I couldn't find a source. So I've made up a speech that I think would have been appropriate for the occasion. You know, modern hist historians would say, you can't do that, you know. But again, we have to realize that the standards of ancient history writing, and, and I, don't, I don't fault him for this. His, it's just a different, um, a different way of doing history. Um, it's not history the way that we do history. Um, but it, it achieves a different end, a slightly different end um, than, than we do. So there was artistry in ancient history. And again, this, this impacts the way we read the book of Acts, possibly, uh, because knowing that in that world, they were allowed to move some things around, put some words into people's mouth, that that, was per that wasn't bad, that was allowed. There's nothing in error about, about that sort of thing. It's just what, the way they, they did it differently than, than we do. And so um, it may mean that sometimes our, if we take our modern explanation uh, expectations and assume them about certain biblical texts, we may be making wrong assumptions, narcissistic assumptions even. Well, also um, uh, Sophie's World talks about uh, the, the births of, of certain kinds of medicine uh, in the Western world, in particular the Hippocratic Oath, you know, do no harm uh, and so forth. Um, and so that's also there. Okay, well, I want to finish up uh, the Hippocratic Oath. I want to, which, which some doctors um, still take today even. Um, I want to finish up this video with Socrates. Um, the lead up to Socrates were a, a group in uh, Athens called the Sophists, uh, the wise guys. Um, they were ethical relativists, again, like, um, uh, like Herodotus, who basically believed that um, whether something was right or wrong depended on uh, either the culture or the situation. Um, they were people that got rich off of teaching. Uh, they were like college professors back then, uh, but they didn't necessarily give you a good product. Um, they were teachers for hire, 
and they, they made their living, you know, by basically um, uh, making people think that they could make you, you know, you or your children smart. Um, they were often skeptics, though. I mean, they didn't really lead you to uh, truth. They more unraveled uh, that which people who thought they were smart. They were more tear down type people than build up type people. Some have suggested that Socrates may have been a sophist, although he denies it. Uh, he denies taking money for his teaching, which some think is even worse. Yeah, you know, what? You corrupted the youth and you didn't even get paid for it? What's wrong with you, man? Uh, but anyway, um, here's a, here's a uh, sophist quote from a guy named Protagoras. Uh, man is the measure of all things. We might, we might see modern secular humanism in some respect as uh, an heir of the sophists. Um, the proper study of man is man, um, is another quote, um, where the God, forget about the gods, the gods don't exist. Let's, uh, what, what is, the, there was a human, humanist manifesto several decades ago that said something like, God's not going to save us. If we are going to be saved, we must save ourselves. So that's kind of uh, sophistic, sophistic thinking. And that leads up to Socrates. Socrates was an interesting fellow uh, by all accounts. Um, he had a friend who went to the Delphic Oracle. There was an oracle in a place called Delphi. It's a lovely place. It's a restaurant. Be sure and try the restaurant. Uh, but um, uh, his friend went to the Delphic Oracle and said, who is the wisest person um, in the whole world? And the Delphic Oracle said, why Socrates? And Socrates says, well, that's not right. I know I'm not the smartest person in the world. Um, and so uh, Socrates, uh, annoyingly, uh, he certainly didn't read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, Socrates went around basically uh, talking to people who are allegedly smart and making them look stupid. So he'd go to a guy, you know, who said, um, uh, here's what, you know, Socrates would say, so what's holiness or what's goodness? And the person would say, why, here's what it is. And then Socrates would unravel their, their pretense to knowledge and make them look like a fool. Um, and then in the end, Socrates basically says, um, well, true wisdom is in knowing your ignorance. Uh, at least I know I'm stupid. These people actually think they know stuff. Um, so maybe I am the smartest person around. You know, wisdom is in knowing that you don't know. Um, the more you know, the less you know, that, that kind of idea. Of course, Socrates made a lot of enemies while doing this. Hold that thought. He, uh, again, I, this isn't a quote from Socrates, but there does seem to have been this sentiment that if you get your thinking straight, then your actions would be straight too. I don't think so. I mean, uh, uh, this is a very... Uh, uh, I've been reading Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and, and Influence People. And in the first chapter, he basically says, you need to realize that people are not, um, people are not logical by nature. People are emotional by nature. And I, I completely agree with this. I think there are plenty of people who may have good ideas who do the wrong things. Um, there, is, there is a massive gap between what you think and how you live, I think, uh, for most people or a lot of people. And also, um, you can think you have right thinking and not have right right thinking. You can be very smart and be really dumb on other other things. So I actually don't have a lot of uh, confidence in this right thinking leads to, to right action. Um, and um, and I don't think I, I personally don't think that learning necessarily always leads to more uh, to more ignorance. I think sometimes um, there are people who know more than others um, and for them to know that they more, know more than others is not for them to be uh, ignorant. Um, so when, when, a, when a medical expert um, knows certain things, um, they certain, like take di diabetes, you know, doc doctors know more about diabetes than I do. And they would not be, um, so I, I, I found out something I was ignorant about on diabetes in, in the last few months. I thought that diabetes was basically your pancreas runs out of making in insulin, you know? Well, we had a good run pancreas, but I've run out of insulin. Um, but, but my doctor, I, I said something about, uh, to my doctor about uh, people who take insulin pills. And he looked at me and he said, I've never heard of an insulin pill. I mean, he's completely serious. He says, huh, 
I've never heard of an insulin pill, as if I would know something more about, about medicine than him. And, and he, he said, no, 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 that's not how these things work. Um, actually, um, uh, a lot of people with type 2 di diabetes, their pancreas is doing just fine making insulin. It's that their, their, their cells don't let the insulin take care of the sugar. Um, and, you know, it's like, bam, I mean, all these, my, my dad had diabetes. And here, all these years, I didn't understand <laughs> what was going on there. Wow. Um, and so, so my doctor knows more about disease than I do. Uh, my doctor knows more about sickness than I do. And it's not because he's, um, oh, you know, doctor, you don't know as much about medicine as you think, you know. Now, there may be some areas where he doesn't, but uh, but what I'm getting at is I, I do think there are still limits even to that. But I'll take the point that the truly wise person realizes how much they don't know uh, and not just how much how much they know. Well, uh, I'm not sure I like this part of Garter, but he, he points out what I would consider to be fairly superficial similarities between Jesus and Socrates. I'll, I'll just go through the list. Neither wrote down their teachings. Okay. Uh, their disciples wrote down their words instead. Okay. Um, they were both masters of discourse. Okay. Um, they were both self-assured. Um, sure. They both spoke on behalf of a greater. Okay. So uh, Socrates spoke on behalf of, of uh, what? Wisdom and Jesus spoke on behalf of God. They both challenged their communities. They both lost their lives for their activities. Both could have saved themselves. Okay. Both had a mission. Uh, they both had enormous followings even after their death. Okay, fine, fair enough. Uh, but of course, uh, I believe Jesus is just a little bit more important than Socrates. Just, you know, that's my, my opinion. All right, well, I want to end this uh, which with um, one of Plato's writings. Socrates did not write down anything. And so what we know of Socrates, we know primarily through people like uh, Plato and someone else named Xenophon. Um, and Plato's apology is basically the death of Socrates. Well, it doesn't tell about his death. It's the trial of Socrates. Forgive me. Maybe I should maybe I should correct that. Yeah, there we have it. The trial of Socrates. There are three Plato. Uh, there are Plato's. Uh, their discourses. There, uh, Plato wrote uh, these little plays, as it were. And so, um, uh, Plato's apology is the trial of Socrates. Then there's the Credo and the Phaedo. Um, and I think I think he dies in the Phaedo, if I remember correctly. But anyway, so. Socrates is, is put on trial for corrupting the youth and for not believing in the gods. And um, he seems to be a rather stubborn man to me. <laughs> uh, I, in fact, I have another video that you may want to watch uh, on uh, the apology uh, in which I basically throw out the possibility that Plato may have been an idiot, or Socrates may have been an idiot um, because he didn't have to die. Um, not, he died because he felt like, well, um, I, I must follow the laws of the land. Uh, well, you didn't follow the laws of the land on these other things. But anyway, um, he's found guilty. He's sentenced to death by hemlock. He drinks the hemlock in, himself. In fact, uh, I can bring up a famous painting by David behind me. There we have it, The Death of Socrates by David. David is one of my favorite painters, maybe, maybe my favorite, not sure. But um, so Socrates is found guilty. Uh, he's sentenced to death. He could have made a counter sentence of a fine. You know, they could have raised a fine. He, he does. He does finally suggest a counter fine. You know, but they they vote him to death. He could have escaped. The Spartans would have taken him. He chose not to. He was a homebody. But uh, anyway, um, one of the, th the it's Plato's apology where we hear this. You know, that the, the truly wise person is the one who knows um, um, that w that we don't know as much as we think we know. And it's also in Plato's Apology that he has this famous quote that the unexamined life is not worth living. Again, not 100% sure that I agree with that, you know, um, but, um, but of course, I suppose we would say that uh, from, a, from, a, from a Christian standpoint, um, it's important to get to the point of examination where you realize that you need, you know, to, to uh, align yourself with, with God. But this has been uh, Socrates and the Natural Philosophers, the first in a series of videos on the history of Western European uh, philosophy. And so we'll be back with Plato and Aristotle in our next installment.